This is We The Sales Engineers Podcast, show 125. Welcome to We The SES Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. All right, what's up, SE Nation? I'm coming to you from a cottage recording this uh, intro. So Benny's constantly moving just so I can tell if I lost reception or not. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're not, then never mind. How's it going, Benny? It's going very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. By the way, I'm your host, Ramzi Marjaba, with my co-host extraordinaire with an extraordinaire beard, Benny Kunungu. <laughs> <laughs> it's very kind. Thank you. Oh, man. It's, uh, so we had a great conversation with the... Uh, yeah, I lost connectivity for oh, a second. I didn't, I didn't hear you. Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's a cottage I, sacrifice. It's well worth it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we had a great conversation uh, with Euron uh, Kultard. Kultard, I butchered his name. Uh, listen to the intro. He actually says his name in a way that's not butchered, so you can listen to it. And he is a, a co-founder and CEO of a new CRM aimed at uh, small business. Uh, yeah, basically small businesses. And I wanted to have this discussion because I wanted to see the mentality of CEOs. And a lot of sales engineers feel like sales engineering you're going to be a sales engineer for the rest of your life or you're going to go into sales but there are a few sales engineers who ended up being ceos that's why we're doing interviews with three ceos in a row this week next week and the week after uh some were se's at one point some were not uh you don't was not um benny i'm hogging the spotlight mainly because i'm worried that the connection will not sh- uh, offer you enough <laughs> chance to actually uh, uh, contribute but did you want to say anything before no i mean that, that was an excellent intro um yeah the, the similarities between like ceos and uh and, and scs i think there are just so many and it's definitely a nice you definitely learn so many great skills being an sc that prepare you to be a CA, ceo i know that you've talked about a lot of them on the show from your experiences um, and, uh, and I think we'll hear about some of those in the takeaways, uh, after the show, but yeah, for those of you that think that, you know, maybe SEing isn't for you because you want for more, well, it turns out that SEing tends to be a pretty perfect, uh, trampoline or, or that you do want or wish for. Yeah. So you cut off the last three seconds, but yeah, basically it's a very good uh, way to actually understand the business and the technical. So if you want to go that route, you can go that route. And I don't know if you just witnessed, but I just killed a bug on my laptop while talking to Benny. Um, by the way, the interview- I was going to say, maybe you killed the bug while killing this intro. Good, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the interview did not take place at the cottage. I was at home. So the audio was clear. Just pointing that out. Let's jump into the show. Good morning or good afternoon, Euron. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good morning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. I know you're a busy person. Maybe we can start off by you introducing yourself and how to say your name correctly, because I think I've already. Yeah. Uh, so, so my name is uh, Jeroen Kurthout. Uh, it's it's a Dutch name. I'm uh, I'm Belgian. Um, so I live in Antwerp, Belgium, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Salesflare. Uh, and Salesflare is a is a CRM system. Uh, you're wondering <laughs> another one. Uh, we are focused on uh, SMBs. Um, we have um, thousands of agencies and tech companies on the software mostly, uh, but we focus on companies that sell B2B. And what we change for them is that uh, we make sure that they don't have to fill out their CRM all the time. It sounds uh, maybe like a promise you've heard before, but we really uh, do that from the core. So our system is built on existing data. It pulls uh, emails from your email system, calendar meetings from your calendar, phone calls from your phone, uh, email signatures, social data, company uh, information, and that offers that to you. Uh, so it starts from automated data. Uh, obviously, you can still uh, adjust it manually, um, but it's really a system that feeds the information to you instead of you having to put it in, uh, which is sort of a, a paradigm change versus other systems. Uh, we, we, we offer that in a, in a system that we make as easy as to use as possible uh, because we want everybody to be able to use it then. That's, that's actually the two main reasons that uh, 
our customers also choose us is the, those, the, these two things. So my question is, why did you decide to start it? I mean, you, you have a history, I think you've done multiple things. You were, but you were an account manager at some point. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, was in, that in the comp? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, in the company where I was an account manager, I, uh, I was using Salesforce. Um, and it was my first, very first CRM system. So I, I took it very seriously and I thought uh, uh, it was going to change uh, a lot of things for me and I was going to completely organize myself in it. Um, I never succeeded to do that with Salesforce. It was, it was built in ways which I could not uh, understand why it was built that way. You know, you're used your whole life to, to, to use these very nice apps on the phone. And then all of a sudden you get thrown into a, an enterprise system where if you, for instance, want to make a task, it's some kind of weird form that then if something happens, it will notify you within Salesforce. It won't do that on your phone like you used to. Oh, you have to log into Salesforce to see it there in this little weird pop-up thing. Uh, and every single thing I had to do in Salesforce felt sort of like that. So I was disillusionized, I would say, with, uh, with CRM systems. Um, in the end, I would just put in... Um, uh, opportunities in there and sometimes a contact so they could get the newsletter but it wasn't a system for me to fault my sales which I always thought it should be but I, I didn't do anything with that for a long time it was only when um, my co-founder and I we were working on a, a business intelligence software company and we had a ton of leads and we were looking ourselves for a better way to follow up uh, our leads and we knew we didn't work with Salesforce we tried a few other systems and we never found anything that we like to use uh, because well, it's, it's one about liking to use it. And second is about um, being able to use it because we always would fail. Uh, we, we are not extremely disciplined at filling out systems. And at some point the CRM would always fail on us um, and we wouldn't have all the information there. And that's that sort of, we figured the things we're filling out now in this system they're actually somewhere else and we're duplicating stuff. So we, we started thinking like we could make a system that, that uh, automates this for us uh, and also ties in very closely with um, email tracking and website tracking. So it gives you a full overview of the, the, the timeline you're having with a customer, including their, their tracking events. That's the initial uh, idea we started with um, six years ago. Yeah, very insightful. Um, so if you don't mind me asking, um, you know, a lot of people sometimes get annoyed or frustrated perhaps with solutions and sometimes may even conceptualize, you know, the, the, the better version of that or something that can actually be better. Um, but very few actually go so far as to actually make that happen. So mm -hmm. what were you and your team, what were some of the challenges or, or maybe some of those steps that you had to take from the point of you being annoyed with those enterprise solutions to the point of actually building your own? What did that journey look like for you? Um, it all started with us deciding to put time in it. Well, first we were thinking about the concept and we were thinking about the name and all that because... I mean, it was important for us to form it in our minds as well. Um, like what was it going to be and how was it going to be named and look like and all those kind of things. Uh, but then as, as soon as we had get, got that tackled, um, then we started thinking like, okay, we, we have our work now with which we earn money, but how are we going to um, be able to work on this? And now we um, started looking around. We fall, found this thing called Kima 15 which was going to give us 150K uh, euros or US dollars. I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not sure anymore. Um, in 15 days for 15% of our equity. Um, and they referred us to a book called um, uh, Getting Real by 37 Signals. The guy's a base camp. Um, and we started reading that book. Um, and we, based on what we read there, we started building a very first prototype that we could show to people, like not build the whole system, but first build something to start conversations. Uh, we built a deck that we sent to Kima. Uh, they didn't end up funding us because we were too early stage, they said, which I understand now. Um, but uh, that's sort of what got us started. Um, we used the same materials to then get into an incubator and an accelerator. 
we got a bit of money there. And from there, things sort of started flowing for us after, I think we only started developing sales for itself after five months or so, where we already had a ton of uh, customer interviews done, uh, a ton of uh, ideas on what to do, sometimes a bit too many. At some point we had to narrow it down a bit uh, back to our original idea because everybody kept throwing stuff at us that was wrong with CRMs and that CRMs should do according to them. Um, but um, we then developed the very first sort of MVP, which was, it did the basics, but it didn't look at all like a CRM system. It was just a, a thing that uh, you, would, you would say, okay, this is, a, this is a, a group of contacts, show me all the emails with them. Uh, and it would do that next to your emails. Uh, and nobody really understood what the purpose of that was. Uh, but that was just because it was for us the technical core of, of all the other things that would happen. Um, and we started then, well, talking to more people to understand what they wanted to have, but also trying to get people to use our system. Um, and with every uh, little iteration there, people saying, no, I, this, this is not right. And this is not right. And people not using it here and there. Um, we started refining it. And that's what we still do. Uh, like every time we hear stuff from customers, put it in the system, list it, link it back to people, ask more questions, prioritize it, and always keep keep building from there. So be before you started actually working on this, what was the mentality? Like you're going from a secure-ish job, uh, which, mm -hmm. uh, or what were you? you were, it was very secure, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you went from a secure job to going into a startup, which is frankly unknown, competing against giants. Mm -hmm. You have your own, like you saw a need in the market and you go after that. In your mind, like how do you make that shift from going from a secure job to something like that? Uh, in my mind personally, I thought if this fails, I go back to my secure job. <laughs> I knew I, I was working at a consultancy and they always needed people and I knew the job um, they were ready to take me back even at a higher day rate uh, than before. So no issue there. I mean, it's uh, the only thing um, that I'm worried about. And actually I, the, the problem keeps getting bigger because as you amass a team, customers, investors, uh, bank loans and things like that, um, it, there's a, um, th the main thing I try to do is not disappoint any of these people. Um, in the beginning, there is not much to disappoint. It's just yourself. So it's, that's, that part is still rather easy. I would say as the company grows, the, the backpack becomes, becomes bigger. It's, you don't just have a, a choice anymore to just say, uh, okay, <laughs> I'll stop tomorrow or something. Uh, that's not a thing anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I would say for most people, you probably can get back to your job. Uh, some, some people might not. I mean, they're losing, they're, they're losing a spot somewhere that somebody else fills and, and they cannot go back. Um, but if you, if you um, let's say, have the abilities of starting your own company, I don't see why you would not be able to get another job after you fail uh, building a startup. I would always advise people, though, to... Um, um, to go part-time, uh, so to talk to their employer, say, can I work three-fifths or something? Uh, and to, to start building in these uh, two days uh, and maybe start in the evenings, although that's super heavy. Um, and then when you, f you feel you can make the leap, make the leap. Um, but if you start a company uh, without any uh, salary, the issue is going to be that you just don't have the runway in many cases, the personal runway, uh, where after, I don't know, maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe two years of not really earning much money with your startup, because that's what happens in the beginning. Uh, you just run out of money and it and becomes uh, impossible for yourself to continue. That's what I would uh, mostly advise. Uh, for. You you didn't mention that now you have people like working for you. 
and you have a big responsibility there. Mm -hmm. Do you have any leadership experience before you moved into being a CEO and how are you managing, making sure everybody's happy, everybody's providing the best work that they can provide to make the company yeah. successful? Um, no real leadership experience. I mean, did some stuff here and there, but never really managed a team to this extent. Um, what we try to do at Salesforce is open. I have a very um, open culture where people actually communicate when there's things wrong. Uh, for that, we have a bunch of things we do uh, because it, it, it's, it's one, it's part of culture. But second, you also need to create the moments for it. So two basic things we do uh, is having one uh, a biweekly team meeting where we have an open discussion with the team about things that are going uh, a bit wrong and things that are going well, and then going over these things and fixing them. Like going over the negatives, uh, fixing them, taking the positives and learning from them. Uh, and secondly, uh, a monthly one-on-one -on -one, um, to sit together with one person really individually uh, and see how things are going, how they think things can be better, that they can bring things to you, this kind of things. Uh, so yeah, you, you want to open up uh, the communication, but you also make place for it. Uh, that they don't have to get to you on Slack at some moment to say, I'm really sick of this or something. Uh, so like, people, I'm assuming startups, people are working long hours. Mm -hmm. Like what incentivizes people in general to leave secure work? Not you, you you already have your, like you're, you're the CEO, leave secure work to work for a startup, longer hours and with little to gain uh, early on. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe I should refer er, that. How no, do you, go ahead. I understand the question. Uh, I must say, initially we would do, uh, like my co-founder and I would skip holidays and we would work way longer hours uh, and all those kind of things. But as you grow a team, uh, that becomes harder and harder. Uh, we do now do very uh, normal working hours. We don't do... Um, bank not uh, working hours, uh, but like uh, it's sort of more than nine to, to six uh, kind of thing. Um, so it, it does, we don't put a whole lot of pressure on people, at least not in, in the amount of working hours. We just try that everybody's productive within the working hours. Um, and convincing people to give up a stable job. Yeah, I don't know. It's just um, giving one, I think, and a nicer atmosphere to work. We're actually building on something and the company is not stuck in its ways and all that, if you know what I mean. It's a yep. lot of a, we're doing something together instead of like, oh, somebody said whatever. Um, um, and secondly, more interesting work also. Um, I remember myself, I, I, I started working at a corporate and I had this little role in which I was only allowed to do these things um, and there wasn't very much freedom for me to do anything else and everything was rather, yeah, not, not extremely interesting. Uh, we, we offer much more um, opportunities to, to grow as a person uh, and to, to work on, on things that actually matter. Okay. Very helpful, or rather very cool. <laughs> uh, I do have a quick question to ask around, uh, you know, you, you've talked a little bit about your past experiences and how things are, um, or rather how you hadn't necessarily managed a team quite at this scale or scope before. Um, mm -hmm. But even still though, I guess going into it, given the experiences that you have had, so whether it be as an account manager, as a specialist, as a kind of in a consultancy role, et cetera, et cetera, did you always kind of feel, or do you, do you find that your methodologies of work, even at a smaller scale and those other activities, did those translate well to the, I guess, the, the methodology of how you work and, and, and the types of processes you have to go through to get things done? at the CEO or founder level, uh, did that translate well or did you find you had to learn a whole new set of skills and, and methodologies? Um, I guess learn, um, but it's, it goes, it's on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not like I feel like uh, there was this moment where I learned so much. It's, we're working on this for six years um, and there's every day you hit certain barriers um, and through that you learn together with the team. Um, I know how I, I, 
how I used to like to do stuff and how I do stuff now has has changed together with that. I've I've learned so much about how we can uh, be more um, um, effective as a team rather than just as just me. Um, just throughout the years, yeah. Fair. Oh, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, it's obviously good to be continuously growing and then kind of look back and retrospect and see how you could have done stuff better. But I would argue that I think still, you still always had this sense of whether it be self-improvement or otherwise the improvement of a team to, to always be their best one way or another, or even just to kind of slowly take things. Um, like say, for example, when you're starting up a new company or when you had to start up a company, um, kind of taking all the steps to kind of map out everything that you want to do before you actually do it. And maybe even ask some people around to do some market research to really understand this a viable opportunity, so on and so forth. Um, I find that a lot of these things, like a large part of our audience are sales engineers or SEs mm -hmm. that kind of serve that type of function. And so um, it's just interesting while listening to you that a lot of the, I guess, the, the mindset that you have as you go through these really big activities, like starting a company and obviously growing it so and things like that um, are very similar, I think, to a lot of activities or the mindset that a lot of SCs need to have or sales engineers need to have, whether they be at an individual contributor level, but particularly at a leadership level, because they have to go through a lot of those same types of, maybe not exact same activities, but the same type of mindset when they're going through the, uh, let's say the introduction of a new initiative or a new project. It's just really cool to hear what you've done to, to, to create a company and how similar that is for a lot of people um, that, that are building things for their companies as SEs or as SE leaders. So anyways, I thought that was interesting. I just wanted to mention it. Cool. Um, in terms of your sales team, like you're, you're trying to sell this product. It's not, you don't just build it and they will not come. You have to go out and sell it. Initially, I'm assuming it was you who was going out and selling the product. Mm -hmm. right. Correct. At what point do you decide that I need more help? I need more salespeople or a sales team or a sales organization. Yeah, um, we did it slightly differently. We don't really have um, a sales team. Um, so the way it worked in the in the beginning is I would go out there, find people who, who were interested. Then I would uh, give them a demo. Then I would put them on the product, do the whole onboarding. Then I would show them around and then follow up with them support wise and all those kind of things. Um, then we started um, sort of automating the beginning there. We started getting some presence on websites. I didn't have to go out there anymore. People would find us and I would still do the rest of the process. Um, then slowly we started making the onboarding process better and better uh, so that I, I didn't have to put people on the software manually and all that anymore. They could just do everything themselves. Um, at some point we, um, started dropping um, the whole uh, demo and onboarding part uh, where people could just sign up for a trial and it would all work. Um, I was still doing support. And then at some point I, I, um, I passed over support uh, to someone. Um, and that's sort of where the whole thing um, was uh, not in my hands anymore. I still do demos often. Uh, now that's when people want demos because in general most people just try a product and 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 don't need us. Um, and I'm now handing that over as well, so it's a it's very much a step by step um, handover of the whole process. Okay. Uh, where in our case it's it's um, partly handed over to the product itself uh, and partly to the support team, but support for us is. It's actually, it's, it's, it's sales as well, you could say, uh, but it's, it's not um, uh, early on sales. It's more the sort of uh, closing the deal, uh, account management and support in one role. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think uh, it's kind of similar to customer success teams right mm -hmm. now where they come in after the sale and make sure the customer is happy with the product. Um, yeah. They also come in before the sale though. Okay. It's like from the moment they get on the trial to, uh, or even before they get on the trial, if they already talked to us on the site or so, they also get in there as well. Okay. Well, so the customer goes in, logs in, and if they have questions, they contact the support team, even if they have not purchased at that point. Does that sound? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. 
it's it's all the same before you purchase after you purchase you okay. just be, yeah you have a, a limited trial so cannot okay. be for free forever yeah yeah well yeah otherwise you'd be out of business really quickly uh, yeah <laughs> I, I get customers like isn't that license supposed to be included in the base license and it'll be the most non-useful license they've ever seen Every, everything everybody wants everything for free but you know if that was the case yeah. nobody, nobody would nobody would work there uh, would be no business uh, yeah. so why did you decide to go that route versus having you know the way that you people usually do it sales people calling cold calling customers especially for uh, small medium businesses do you are you seeing more traction in this uh, in this way um we get um, over a hundred people a week signing up uh, to our trial, which is a uh, very hard to recreate with outbound sales. Uh, these are all people who are um, actually actually interested, like looking for a serum in that moment. Um, we find that when we go out, we can create some trials and all that, but it's it's really limited. Um, at, at some points, I always think about uh, retrying uh, and I have another idea now to, to try some, some outbound sales again, um, but we've never really had uh, a huge success uh, with it. What works best for us is, uh, is grabbing people at the moment that they're looking for a CRM rather than trying to get them to get a new CRM, let's say. How do you make sure customers will keep like will find out about you and will continue like right now you have 100 people a day you said no that was a week yeah no, okay how do you make sure that you're going to continue to have 100 people a week uh coming in and subscribing and how are you trying to make it more like 100 yeah people a day? No, I mean, keeping it that way is not so hard i mean we have presence build up in many places uh we got people coming just just about everywhere people recommending other people all these kind of things growing it is what's harder um because we we're fighting against very big players which have much more budget to throw against uh, getting traffic um it's for us it's more of a step-by-step -step building that rather than massively growing uh, massively growing this let's say um it's a uh, an uphill battle but uh it's a uh, it's a challenge as well yeah like i can imagine um so when you say presence what do you mean by that are you like doing blogs or wh what does that mean exactly what do you say bots uh, blogs blogs oh we are certainly doing blogs um our seo is uh, something we actively work on that's one um so it's getting people when they look at specific topics to that they find our blog can read about uh, for instance uh, how to build a solid sales pipeline um, and then we start introducing how Salesforce works for a sales pipeline um, that's one second it's our presence on things like review sites it's getting people third to um, to recommend Salesforce to their um, to their friends colleagues uh, or from other companies mostly yeah? um it's also um well i think we're currently trying is to build out a partner network see whether that works we have a few partners now uh, that um are becoming active there so that's a good thing but we're we're looking to do more um what else oh and it's it's getting listed in all, all kinds of places like okay. we are not the only one who uh ends up in um in search results so there's a lot of people uh, listing uh, crms and all that getting listed there um the issue with getting listed in places though is that uh, we don't have uh, again the same amount of budget to spend so some people uh, bid an enormous amount of money to be listed and we just can't so but you know there's always opportunities all right benny i think you had a question you're on mute. <laughs> yes, I was. Thank you. <laughs> um, so as you're driving a bunch of traffic via your presence and, um, mm -hmm. and obviously have people referring uh, their, their friends and colleagues from different companies to your product, just a quick question. Do you also have salespeople or is it, um, or is it mostly, you know, community led, I suppose, your growth? 
Um, the mostly organic, yeah. Oh wow. We like like I said, our, our sales is is our support. Uh, we try to be helpful, uh, get people to understand the product, get people to uh, find all the right things, hook up the right things, um, com be convinced that Salesforce is right for them or, or wrong for them, perhaps. Uh, we rather also, when Salesforce is not the right choice, we rather not have uh, the people trying to use Salesforce. Um, but we don't have a separate sales function at this point. I, I do some sales follow, but it's very limited. No, that's okay. Actually, it's kind of cool that you say that and that it almost brings, it almost brings us all back around to, um, or, or I guess it almost brings the full circle to some degree in my head in that it looks like right now you're obviously running a very lean team. Um, you're playing against some giants in the industry and are obviously doing relatively well uh, by doing that. And I think it's really cool that you mentioned that you have your support function kind of playing the part as pseudo sales or at least in that pre-sales function to make sure that a customer feels comfortable, a prospect anyways feels comfortable, they have all their mm -hmm. questions answered and everything. Um, and then once they actually sign on, they're, they're, they're then supported by people they're already familiar with. But having that technical expertise in the sales function, this is typically what the sales engineer in maybe other organizations that have that as a separate role, that's what they're kind of doing. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of cool that your salespeople, um, quote unquote, I suppose, are, are serving that function and your support people are, are, are serving that function. And, and yeah. That's yeah. actually very hard. Um, that's uh, <laughs> always a process when we get someone new um, to get someone up to the level that they can uh, properly fill that role. But there's one thing that helps though, is that we have uh, next to the, um, uh, the support person, there's always um, a developer standby uh, we call the support hero um, and that person can help with any very technical things that arise or issues or whatever uh, they need looking at uh, so that kind of helps but then there's still a whole lot of other things where which are not strictly technical uh, but more functional especially with a crm system which is rather uh, complicated even if we make it easy to use there's a lot of functionality in there uh, and there's a lot of dependencies with other products and all that um it 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 takes a bit to get someone uh, properly up to speed there uh that's something we're we've been working on beginning of this year also to have a, a playbook and all for that um but still still a lot of work to do there i just want to we need to move on to the next next round but i um, i just went on your website and i clicked on one of your blogs and you have a picture of the crm landscape and I can't read a single logo on there. It's just because there's so many logos of people working on CRMs. And it's interesting that you choose that, that kind of landscape to come in. And you must, have, you must have in mind something really different to be able to actually go in and compete with that. So yeah. that's... Uh, yeah, still difficult. But... <laughs> do, do you hear a, a peep in the background? Uh, yeah, I hear something, uh, but it's okay. Uh, I, I can I can uh, remove it and then you can maybe cut this out or sure it's up to you. Uh, one sec. <laughs> Do you hear the, the garbage truck? Oh, that was a, I no I have one on my end. Um, okay. Yeah, I <laughs> know yeah, your side. Your, however. There's a, a storm starting outside. Oh. <laughs> the advantage is you won't uh, hear them the, the mowing the grass anymore because I think they went inside. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> the wind is, is blowing like crazy. It's, it's oh, all yeah. good. It's all good. Uh, it is time to move on to the not so fire round. These are four questions we ask every guest to get your okay. input. Right. And usually Benny starts us off. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, you've given us quite a bit of insight with respect to, um, you know, what you've kind of your mindset when going through uh, starting up your own company and some of the, at least some of the challenges anyways, you have to come up against. Um, but quick question, what do you love about being an entrepreneur and, and what you're doing right now? Um, building stuff. It's always been from, very exciting to build. It doesn't, doesn't have to be the product. It can be building the team. It can be people building traffic, building an experience around it, building the website, whatever. Um, it's just 
being able to see um, progress and something grow uh, is, I think, what gives the most satisfaction. Nice. All right, second question. If there's one thing you would change about being an entrepreneur, what would that be? Um, um, I don't know whether it's, you can change it. It's the, the, the problem that you're carrying around a huge amount of responsibility. It often weighs on you. Uh, whether it can be sh changed and should be changed, probably not. I think it just comes with the job and you need to uh, cope with it. Yeah, that makes sense. Very cool. Um, you've mentioned one book a little bit earlier in the show, so maybe that one, maybe others. Uh, what are some books, tools, or resources that you'd recommend for um, anybody wanting to follow your path? Um, I mentioned about our culture earlier, um, how we try to have an open culture and all that. Um, I'm pulling up the book um, that I recommend. It's, I think, by Kim Scott. Mm -hmm. Radical um, Candor, maybe? Radical Candor, indeed. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's a really great book. Uh, I really liked it. Uh, recent good books that I've read. Um, the Art of Game Design, A Book of Lenses. It's very specific to product building, but it made me think in a, in a whole different way about uh, building a product. I read Zig Ziglar recently, The Secrets of Closing the Sale. I, I never did because I thought it was uh, some sort of salesy book that was not applicable at all. But then when I actually read through it, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of wisdom in there. Um, if you're interested in storytelling, uh, one that uh, blew my mind is Save the Cat um, by Blake Snyder, the last book on screenwriting you'll ever need. It sort of shows you the, the, the structure of, of uh, he claims, any good Hollywood movie, uh, especially when combined with uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, which is about mythology, how, how any good myth is built up. It's, it's really mind-blowing. Um, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. I have a Goodreads account if you're interested to follow. Um, just type my name on Goodreads and, and you can follow the books. I leave reviews, so I write okay. what I liked about the book and why and all those kind of things. Uh, so that might help for the listeners as well. Okay. All right. I, I, I've never heard of Goodreads, but I'll, I'll take a look at it right now. <laughs> Goodreads is sort of like the, let's say IMDb, you know, for yep. movies. It's, okay. it's very similar. Uh, it's, you, 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 you can see scores of books, how many people read it, who of your friends uh, read the book, or who of your friends want to read the book, what, how they scored it, reviews from anyone. Uh, so it's a great resource to find uh, new books to read and to know which books are good. Okay. All right. I'll make sure to add a link to that in the show notes. Last question uh, of the not so fire round. I'm going to change it up a little bit. How do you define a successful uh, entrepreneur? Oh, good question. Um, I think a successful entrepreneur is anyone who can um, build something that aligns with their vision or at least with an adapted vision that they got while building it. And, um, you don't necessarily need to uh, raise funding or have a massive team or something, but uh, have, an, uh, have, a, have a sizable impact on the world or at least the, the part of the world that you decided to focus on. Okay, nice. Well, thanks uh, for coming on. Last question of the day. Where can people reach out to you, find out more about you or Salesflare? Uh, Salesflare is easy. It's on uh, salesflare.com. Um, Flare is F-L-A-R-E. Um, and to find me, uh, you can copy my name somewhere. If you type, put it in Google, I think you'll find my LinkedIn account. Uh, you can connect with me there, but then please include a message because I get a, a lot of connection requests without message and then I don't know who that is, random person, and uh, right. that doesn't help. But if you... Um, 
if you put in a message and say that uh, you you heard me on we the sales engineers then uh, awesome. i will certainly accept All right and i will send you a linkedin connection soon uh, um thanks a lot for coming on we appreciate it and uh you know let us know if we can help you with any in any other way same and that brings us to the end of the show thank you everybody for listening thanks you don't um whenever i say that his name i remember you on great joy from uh from uh what's it called game of thrones so i hope yeah, i'm sure. saying his name right yeah. i, I listened <laughs> so I, I listened to the podcast like three times i'm just listening to the first few seconds where he actually says his name and i've been practicing saying his name and then like i've set up i brought everything outside because the kids are still inside trying to go to sleep it's 8 41 we're on vacation they get to go late and practicing and i forgot how to not butcher his name so i apologize for that uh, <laughs> I, i'm really trying hard and you know short memory what did you think Benny? Yeah, that was better than I could do. So, I thought it was great. I thought it was a really cool show that really gave a lot of insight to the mindset of a CEO. Um, but more, even more interestingly than that, like it gave the mindset of a CEO with risk, or rather, it really showed a lot of similarities with respect to the mindset of an SC and and the decisions he has to make. They're so similar to what we have to go through in the world of sales engineering. So I thought that was super cool. Yeah. So I took down some notes. Uh, the one thing I noticed is that he was an early stage funding, uh, early stage startup, and he didn't get funding because of that. Oh, the light is blue in the screen. Um, and that reminded me of a lot of people who are aspiring to be SEs, but they are so early in, the, in their career that they, it's hard for them to do it. But in the end, he was able to actually get funding, obviously, because he started, the, started his, uh, his company. So find a way, basically. If you're looking to become yeah, a large- SE... Yeah, no, I'm just saying like you can become an inside SE, you can become an associate, a junior, whatever. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Uh, well, I think the, 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 the timing of the leg or whatever is, isn't the best. However, um, I was just agreeing with what you're saying. Aaron, stick to keep on going. Um, to, to build something up from, from well, to get that funding and to grow it from, from an initial stage onwards, which is super similar to a mindset that, well, you see a lot of SCs having, but even SCs to, to, to be, um, a lot of perseverance, especially as we see it through, saw through the last show with the No SE Left Behind initiative, you need that perseverance um, to, in order to succeed. And it was cool to see him, uh, see him um, I don't know, be that or show that. I can't think of the right word. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, basically, well, he uh, he lived that by doing it. And he, he, he didn't talk about it, he just did it, which is great. Um, the second thing I, I also kind of uh, equate is when we work with customers, we get a lot of feedback about what's crappy about our product and what's crappy about our like competitors' products and what we should be implementing. And he did the same thing and then kind of have to choose which ones to go after, which ones to fix. We don't get that choice, but we have to, always relay that information to the higher ups and he got the chance to do it but it was a kind of a weird structure in my opinion where the support team was also the sales team um i guess that's what happens when you're an early stage startup you do everything so that works for him yeah um the one thing i i wanted to bring up that had nothing to do with sales engineering is the fact that salesforce is a behemoth you know and there's a lot of competitors like oracle there's Microsoft Dynamics. There are competitors to Salesforce, and Salesforce is like the big um, elephant, the people everybody can uh, compete against. And he still started a business within that domain where he's actually niching down and targeting small to medium businesses, which might give him a slight edge over, uh, you know, trying to aim for the same customers that Salesforce, that Salesforce might think that, oh, these small to medium businesses are not really my bread and butter they're like there's too it's too transactional so i don't know maybe as sales engineers we can actually come up with sales strategies to go after certain companies especially if we're uh, not the incumbent which is kind of what i did in the in my previous uh, role right 
and even from an individual perspective, I feel like a lot of SEs, first maybe even newer SEs, more, or even those that haven't become them but want to be, they might find the whole job market or other SEs as competition uh, as being almost insurmountable to, 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 to get into a role or whatever it may be. But it just may be that as an individual, you might have, um, I don't know, a specific view on things or a fresh look on things or perspective that can cause you to actually be extremely um, I don't know, attractive to a specific company or to a specific role that uh, that you may not have thought of yourself to be. I guess it all just comes down to belief and and, and your confidence in yourself. If you're in, um, sorry for the name butchering as well. Um, he, he he, I think he had a very you know crystal clear and laser focused vision as a uh, with respect to what it is he wanted to accomplish, and uh, it was really cool to see him you know push and and go there with that always in mind. Yeah, and also to to piggyback on that, um, we kind of did a, a podcast a couple of weeks back with uh, uh, William Aruda, who talks about personal branding and finding out what your your unique uh, what your uniqueness is, or your special power, or your competitive edge, whatever you want to call it. That's what he did. So it, that always comes back to personal branding, and knowing uh being that being knowing why competitive edge and showing that is two totally different stories and they should link up um uh, in order to you know get a job that you want anyways that was a very good show man i i enjoyed talking to to your so we're gonna end it here um make sure to share like subscribe whatever it is that youtubers and podcasters say if you have been affected by no SE left behind last week's episode were three interviews we did on the, on, well, on the initiative, which were posted on LinkedIn. And we're going to, I'm going to continue every, I don't know, a couple months. I'll try to combine a few interviews together and publish them on link on uh, the podcast as well. So to get maximum exposure and help as many people as possible. Any final words, Benny? Uh, nope, that's everything. Hope everyone is, uh, is, is again, staying safe, doing well. Um, you know, second wave is coming around the world for COVID. So do be careful and everything like that. But uh, at the same time, um, yeah, I don't know. Enjoy the last little piece of the summer as you have it. It's good to see Ramsey out enjoying it with his family. Um, hopefully you all are as well. And for those of you in Northern climates, um, you know. You cut off the last few minutes after northern climates, but I assume you said something to the effect of uh, enjoy it while it lasts. Sounds about right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, sir. We're, we're, we're sick. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Thanks for uh, <laughs> allowing me to record this intro and outro from my cottage. Uh, not my cottage, a rental cottage. Um, and we'll see you guys next time. Uh, for Benny, this is Ramsey, and we're signing off.